On behalf of the university, I would like to extend a very warm, warm welcome to you all to this event, which is entitled Why Race Equality Matters. I just want to um, explain, we've already had a, a question um, in our Q&A chat box, um, whether there's a question mark after that statement or not. And I just want to stress that there's not, um, that it is a statement um, why race equality matters. And this is the inaugural event um, in the university's programme um, for Black History Month. Um, the university is running a series of events uh, during the month of October, um, acknowledging and celebrating um, black people and their contribution. My name is Pam Milne and I'm the Director of HR and Organisational Development here at the University, um, as well as being a member of the, the University's Executive Group. Um, and I will be hosting um, this event uh, this afternoon. So welcome to you all. 20 years ago, US academics John Dovidio and Samuel Gartner likened racism to a virus that has mutated into forms more difficult to recognise. And I think that statement still holds true um, today. Many organisations, this university included, attempt to combat the issue by employing diversity and inclusion specialists, setting up networks, um, running training. And I'm not belittling any of these activities. I, I do believe these are important. But even despite those activities in those organisations, racism, racism still exists. So how can we tackle this issue? in particular, the low number of black and ethnic minority staff that we have in our own organisation. A good starting point is for everyone, especially white people, is to take time to understand the lived experiences of others. So we have two speakers this afternoon who um, I'm sure are going to help us unpack some of those issues for us. The first is Professor Harry Hundle. Harry first joined the university in 1993. He was pro promoted to a professor in 2010 and holds the Chair of Molecular Physiology in the School of Life Sciences Division of Cell Signaling and Immunology. Harry is also the university lead for the Race Equality Charter. Our second speaker is Martha Uni Udi Uzi, who is a master's student in our School of Education and Social Work, and who also holds the role of Vice President Academic in Dundee University Student Association, DUSA. Martha is joining us this afternoon um, from Nigeria, and uh, we did have some technical difficulties um, this afternoon when we were testing things out earlier today. So I'm very much hoping that we have technology um, on our side when it comes uh, to Martha's turn to speak. Uh, this event is scheduled for around um, an hour. Um, each of our speakers uh, will talk for around 20 minutes. And um, during this time, questions can be posted in the chat. Um, and uh, I very much hope that we'll have time for at least some of those questions to be asked um, after we've heard from, from both speakers. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Harry Handel to speak. OK, I hope everyone can see me. So. Thank you, Pam, and um, hello everyone who has tuned into this live event. I want to start by saying what an honour it is to kick off the university's uh, Black History Month uh, an event that the University of Dundee has been celebrating for the past three years, but one that was first launched um, in the UK back in 1987 in London. Now, whilst the UK celebrates back Black History Month, uh, uh, a number of other countries, uh, including the USA, actually uh, where it originated, commemorate the event throughout February. And 
the reason for this is perhaps not so widely appreciated, but the Black History event actually dates back to 1926 in the US, at which time it was known as Negro History Week and celebrated during the month of February. In the 1970s, uh, there were calls for it to be extended uh, for the whole month of February. And in 1976, it was officially recognized as an annual event by the federal government that was led, I believe at the time by Gerald Ford. Now, despite the difference in timing, Black History Month, be it in the USA or UK, uh, shares a common purpose, and that is to celebrate the history, achievement and contributions of black people, but perhaps perhaps more significantly to, to challenge the, the perceived invisibility of black people and to confront the racial inequality and negative stereotypes that are so often the only manner in which black people are portrayed in, in popular culture. Now this year, the Black History event is perhaps uh, even more poignant, uh, given how the, the death of one black individual, George Floyd, uh, ignited a, a global unrest and forced many nations to face up to some very uncomfortable uh, home truths about their own historical legacies around, for example, the transatlantic slave trade, as well as their imperial past. Now, the shocking manner in which George Floyd was killed stunned the entire world, and it resonated with so many across the globe, not because it was exceptional, but because it was not. By no means exceptional in what is supposedly meant to be the greatest democracy on the planet and one that proudly badges itself as the land of the free, given the ever growing roll call of uh, black Americans, such as, well, Jacob Blake, uh, who else? Breonna Taylor, whose case has been recently brought to our attention across our TV screens because of the protests that are taking place in Louisville. Uh, Atiana Jefferson, Stephen Clark, uh, Botham Jean, um, Alton Sterling, all of whom, were killed as a consequence of the manner in which the police had acted. The list, sadly, is much longer and shameful and unfortunately not exceptional elsewhere. Some of you may recall a name that hits much closer to home, and that is of Sheku Bayou, originally from Sierra Leone, who died after being arrested and restrained by police in Kokodi in May uh, 2015. Now, Sheku's death shares striking similarity with that of George Floyd. Eyewitness reports indicate that the arresting officers were kneeling and lying on Mr. Bayou in order to restrain him. And less than five minutes after the encounter had begun, he was unconscious and an hour or so later, he died in the Victoria Hospital in Kokodi. His death was declared as being drug related but there was also post-mortem evidence to suggest that positional asphyxia effectively being suffocated as a result of how he was being restrained is likely to have contributed to his death. Now, now no matter what the nature of his arrest might have been, uh, eyewitness reports indicate that the police went in extremely heavy handed, escalating rather than trying to defuse the situation. Subsequent uh, reports by the, the BBC actually named one of the arresting officers for his known history of violence and hatred for black people. However, none of the officers were prosecuted and only for the persistence of Sheku's family and the public outcry for truth and justice did the Scottish government finally relent and announce last November that a, a public inquiry will now take place into Sheku's death. Some feel that this inquiry, um, you know, might be as important for Scotland as the Stephen Lawrence uh, case was in England in terms of examining the issue of institutional racism at what clearly uh, is a critical uh, watershed moment, I think, for, for Scotland. Now, like me, some, some of you might be crying out there saying, oh, let me neck, not another inquiry. After all, we've had recommendations from the McPherson report into how the Metropolitan Police 
handled this Stephen Lawrence murder. Um, if I look down at my list here, we have 35 recommendations from the from the Lamy report into how members of the BME community are treated by the by the criminal justice system. We had 110 recommendations from the Angelini review into deaths into police custody. 30 recommendations from the Home Office review regarding the Windrush scandal and 26 in the McGregor Smith review into workplace discrimination. Now, when there appears to be such sustained reluctance by government and institutions to fully implement the, the, the recommendations from, from so many inquiries, it perhaps should come as no surprise to anyone why an incident like the, the callous killing of George Floyd would serve to ignite the, the pent up frustration and impatience of those who are at the receiving end of uh, racial injustice. And, and for this to have then spilled onto the streets, as we all saw in early summer, where folks of all racial backgrounds effectively came together in solidarity in the midst of a global health pandemic to say enough is enough. Many who participate, uh, participated in those, um, the, those protests, I think would argue that their actions um, are, are, are part of a continued clarion call highlighting the sort of centuries long injustices and in inequality that are still being leveled to this very day in places like the US against the descendants of African slaves. So when a prime minister who unfortunately is known for having used language that reinforces negative racial stereotypes, sort of said in May, I think it was mid June actually, that he wanted to change the, the narrative around BME communities and end the sense of victimization and discrimination by holding yet another government led inquiry on race equality, which, which incidentally uh, would be led by one of his aides who considers that institutional racism is a myth and has railed against multiculturalism. Many within the BME community felt that the Prime Minister's words sounded rather hollow and that yet again um, the issue was being kicked into the long grass. Now for many in the UK um, the concept or the notion of institutional racism is one that has been predominantly framed by the media in the context of um, UK policing practice. But of course what the term really refers to is the racial bias that exists within all organizations including universities and in particular the failure of such institutions to recognize the unwitting yeah unwitting prejudice that exists within some of our own internal structures and and processes now there is plenty of academic research out there uh, that evidences the um, the presence of race inequality in UK universities and I would certainly point you to a recently very good published book written by a white academic called Katie Shan at the University of York who has explored uh, institutional racism in British universities and based on the numerous case studies that, that she's carried out she highlights the sort of endemic racism that lingers behind what she calls superficial taglines that are widely used by universities in their marketing material, job adverts and their websites that, that espouse their values and responsibilities with respect to inclusivity, diversity, um, investment in non-white academics and their commitment to race equality when, when this is simply not borne out by some of the available data. So for example, over the past decade, uh, studies highlight that BME individuals are being marginalized in UK universities. Data from HESA, which is the Higher Education Statistics Agency, reveal that for the year 2012 to 2013, for, for the nearly 18,000 professors that exist in the higher education sector, only 85, that's less than 1%, were black. 950 were Asian. 365 were identified as a, in, including mixed race. Over 15,000 were white. Our own institution sadly does not escape this rather sad statistic, as to my knowledge, 
of the 181 professors at the University of Dundee, there is not one that identifies as black or Negro. So in terms of black female uh, professors, there are only just 17 in the entire British university system. And in January 2017, the, for the third year in a row, the HESA data uh, basically showed no black academics in the elite staff categories of managers, directors and senior officials for the 2015-2016 year. So given this rather distorted topography or, or landscape, BME academics are on the whole less likely to be shortlisted, appointed or promoted in comparison to their white colleagues. In addition to this, sector-wide analysis shows that BME academics at top universities throughout the UK earn on average 26% less than their white colleagues. In 2017, our own university published data on the gender and ethnicity pay gap, revealing despite the small number of professorial BME staff, which you know might be uh, an issue in itself, the existence of a significant pay deficit to white colleagues. So the data paints a rather bleak picture showing that very little has actually been done to encourage progress on race equality in British universities. Now I know that some of my colleagues might wish to discount the presence of racial bias within our within our university uh, processes and consider that as an institution we're enlightened individuals who are here, we are liberal, we are progressive and we operate in a colorblind manner. Such a view sadly dismisses the very lived experiences and the daily microaggressions that BME staff and students tolerate, not just in our academic environment, but in the wider community that is off campus. Speak to black and minority ethnic individuals in staff networks and they list white staff students not being able to pronounce their names, the feeling that they are being subjected to extra scrutiny or the feeling they are being labeled as well labeled as troublemakers for raising issues um, both um, you know of, of bullying or harassment both on and off campus the list goes on and on unless you have walked in the shoes of someone who has had those experience you will never fully appreciate the sense of exclusion or belittlement that can have serious knock-on effects in, on the confidence and life opportunities of people of color. We have to stop ignoring or sidelining the issue of race equality and I say this because unless we address some of the problems I have touched upon, the, the various international markets that the university is currently targeting in terms of overseas student recruitment, parts of Africa, India, China for example, well they may not be happy recruiting grounds for very long if the experience of the students from these regions once they arrive in Dundee does not match the sales pitch that Dundee, both the university and the city is a diverse, safe, supportive and inclusive environment to come to. A recent article in the Times Higher estimated that despite the impact of COVID, more than 600,000 students, international students, will come to study in the UK over the next decade. But it also warned that unless universities adapt to accommodate the growing diversity that these students will bring and have effective mechanisms in place for managing tensions around race equality and inclusivity, whether in the, in the virtual or the, the, um, the physical space, these students will remember our commitments and our actions or the lack thereof. This is an important issue. Our university experiences, good or bad, remain with us for our entire lives. Now, I say this as someone who has had a near 40 year association with the University of Dundee. I came to Dundee in 1980 and I have fond memories of my time as an undergraduate but I also had experiences that I much rather forget. In 1980, the university had accepted far too many first year students that it couldn't accommodate in its halls of residences. Belmont was full, West Park was full, and many of the new students, including myself, were placed in accommodation that had been leased out from the health board. I ended up being placed in Merrifield Nurses Home in the east end of Dundee, just off Arkley Street. 
early on in the first semester, I had arranged to actually meet up with one evening with some friends in a pub close by to where we were staying. I mean, I arrived slightly early and before my friends, but immediately I felt unwelcome as three lads in the bar turned around and one of them said to the others, what the effing hell's a packy doing in here? Now I decided to backtrack and leave, but was followed out and subsequently assaulted. I did not report the incident because I was in a new and very unfamiliar city, but also because for me, such incidents were not uncommon growing up during 1970s in a West London suburb. The journey home from school required me to walk through a a largely white occupied council estate that sadly I dreaded. It would often involve either being racially abused or being beaten up by the by the white kids on the estate. It was also a time when the activities of the National Front were at their height and the numerous stickers that were plastered on neighborhood lampposts or the graffiti that would appear on garden walls telling folks like me in not so friendly terms to go back home served as a constant reminder that people like me were not welcome in British society. Now, apart from the occasional racial slur or name calling in the Dundee Students Union on a Friday or Saturday night, I'm pleased to say that my time as an undergraduate was largely positive. But I suppose, I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that even to this day, Every time I drive past that pub that I walked into nearly 40 years ago, that negative experience is stoked and it's replayed in my head. Now, I don't claim to know or understand whether the lived experiences of black students are in any way similar to mine. How can I? I have not walked in their shoes and I have not lived their lives. But what I am able to do is to empathize with their struggles because racial abuse, discrimination or the or the sense of exclusion is unex, unacceptable, irrespective of whether you are black or brown like me. The question that I suppose needs asking is, are the incidents like those that I describe exceptional and a thing of the past? Well, sadly, I don't think so. In October 2019, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, published a damning report into into racial harassment in publicly funded universities in England, Scotland and Wales. The report painted a stark picture of the challenges facing the sector, indicating that around a quarter, 24% of students from ethnic minority backgrounds reported experiences of racial harassment um, since starting their courses. While some were overtly racist in nature, um, involving, for example, name calling and physical attacks by white students. Many highlight subtle and nuanced microaggressions, such as being ignored or excluded from conversations, group activities, as well as being exposed to racist or, uh, or, or dis racist, racist uh, displays on campus. Such experiences will impact on, on student morale, on student engagement and ultimately attainment. And why is this important? Well, Universities UK and the National Union of Students co-produced a report just last year in May 2019 titled Closing the Gap, which highlighted a stark 13% attainment differential between the likelihood of white students and students from BME backgrounds getting a first or upper second class degree among the 2017-2018 graduating cohort. These gaps exist at the vast majority of universities in the UK, including Scotland, between students of different ethnicities, something which, something which the report suggests cannot simply be explained by the student's background or prior qualifications. Many graduate level jobs and further study opportunities require applicants to achieve a 2-1 or better. The attainment gap is a serious problem that needs tackling it harms diversity, which is a problem for everyone. So it shouldn't be left to the BME community to fix. Irrespective of student ethnicities, universities have a responsibility to, to, to address the attainment gap and ensure that there's a level playing field for all our students. 
within our university, we need to do better in promoting a culture of greater inclusion through values that are based on respect, trust and collaboration, which are important both in terms of learning from different viewpoints and embedding thinking on ethnicity and inclusivity into our daily work, as this will allow, uh, allow us to individually and collectively achieve what I suppose we all want to do, and that's transformative change. This has always been important, but hard data from our public health bodies on the significant and disproportionate impact that COVID has had on people from BME backgrounds, the, the, the death of um, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests has brought a, well, it's brought a sense of urgency and a, and a sharper focus to the issue and therefore the need for real change. Now, if I can just have a couple of extra minutes, I want to close by just saying that one way that the university can demonstrate its, um, its, its strategic intent and, and commitment is to reflect on its, on its internal processes and assess in detail the key issues and barriers around race equality that stand in the way of BME staff and students. This process will require consulting staff and students, which I believe we have already been doing via staff student surveys over the past couple of years, but also conducting focus groups and gathering data around issues such as recruitment, promotion, pay equality, student attainment, that will allow the university to, well, to formulate, to formulate a plan that helps bring about real and lasting change which I would very much like to see outlined in an application to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, for a race charter mark from say advanced HE. Now much like Athena Swan, which is designed to recognize and promote the careers of women in STEM subjects, the, the race equality charter works in a similar way, but focuses on race diversity and covers academic staff, professional and support staff, student progression, attainment, as well as diversity in the curriculum. The bar for being awarded a charter mark is extremely high. And according to the Advance HE website, there are currently only 66 institutions that have signed up for REC membership. Dundee is one of them. But only 15 hold a bronze charter award around the world. That's on their, on their website. Now, despite the stringent vetting process, Submitting a race charter application will send a clear message that as an institution, we value diversity, equity and inclusion. Moreover, irrespective of whether we are successful or not in getting the charter mark, the application process will generate a roadmap that we can implement towards achieving our strategic goal, and that is one of greater race equality. Now, given the current post-Brexit climate and the substantial insecurities and risks that have been created by the COVID crisis, we need to clearly demonstrate our values and commitments to serving the needs and the expectations of a diverse staff and student community. And it seems to me that pushing forward with the race charter will certainly help signal that intent. So I think I've said enough and probably gone beyond my allotted time. So I'll stop at this point. So it's back to you, Pam. Thank you very much, Harry, for sharing um, both your own lived experiences and, and your views. Um, it was both hugely heartfelt and, and hard hitting. Um, so, so many thanks again. Um, and, and I hope we can um, rise to the challenges that, that you've set before us this afternoon. So um, with uh, great excitement and much pleasure, I believe we do have Martha with us. So I'll now hand over to Martha. Hi, everyone. I am Martha Ume Udeze, a master's student of social work and the current vice president of academia at DUSA. I am here to talk about my personal experience being a student here in Scotland, UK, precisely University of Dundee. But before I commence, I would like to appreciate all the coordinators of this great event and to officially launch DUSA's 2020 Black History Month event opened. My personal experience in the university has been awesome and what why I must say. 
when I first came in as a fresher, a lot of thoughts ran through my mind while making my travel arrangement plans. I was uncertain about a lot of issues regarding race, culture, and diversity. Then coupled with the fact that I was virtually the last person to get started in my class. I had struggled to get to know about my new environment and building relationships also, trying to know my classmates and as well as lecturers too. I had a lot of struggle, especially understanding the pattern of culture and how things work in my school. But honestly, what surprises me most was that I got massive help from most of the university staff. Starting from getting registered, induction with all the with all the staff members, as well as getting um, prepared and registered with all the reg regulatory bodies that my course of study required. What also amazed me most was how my dean, Shona Robertson, took her time, brought me into her office on my first day here in the university and allowed me to use her seat and PC while she explained a lot of coursework, models, and readings. I need to do a lot, but then I was a bit, um, a kind of challenged because everything seems new. Everything seems different from where I'm coming from as an, as an international student. But how Shona Robertson explained everything to me, it made me understood every word she said because she has a way of explaining it the way I understood. And I was also introduced afterwards to my practice tutor, lecturers and other staff members. It was mind blowing to me and I don't think I can ever forget that day because that was the height of kind gesture I received so far as a fresh student. And it did not only give me a warm welcome, but also made me realize that I am at I am home, away from home. And then moving over to my practice tutor, Maura Daly, who since the onset of my studies has been totally amazing and helpful in various ways, ranging from helping me develop my academic skills, building my civics, motivating me to do more academic academically and career-wise. My experience with her is really a positive one and I appreciate her effort so far. Also, many thanks to all my amazing lecturers who I have not mentioned so far and has taught me in one way or the other. Presently, I'm with DUSA and my experience so far has been on a different dimension and a positive one too, I must say. Working with a large team and making crucial decisions on certain discussions relating to student union has really been the one of the best experience I have had so far. Furthermore, moving over to my experience on race and cultural diversity here in Scotland, it has really been a different one, talking from an international um, perspective. Ways of doing things may be difficult because of the nature, culture, already in existence. But then change is inevitable. However, the key thing to note here is determination to remain focused, figuring out what one wants to aim and achieve or what you need to acquire at the space of time being set out, either while studying, working or career wise. Finally, I urge not just black race, but everyone wherever you may find yourself, do what you find strength in and don't be discouraged at all in whatever you feel you deserve and what is right to do, especially when it's the right time for it. You may have or not set yourself up for failure first from the inner deep thought or defeat or success. But the key thing here to note is determination is the key. That's the point I want to raise here. Now, that brings me to my own very own story and journey of becoming the vice president of academia at DUSA. 
when I first declared my intention of running the campaign and coming out for election of being the vice president of academia, I was massively discouraged of even thinking about it. A lot of people told me it's impossible to be voted for or even to be elected because I'm from the black race. Many said it was only for white students and I should forget about it and not waste my time. But I insisted and gave it my best. I did all the necessary campaigns, manifesto, shared my flyers, posters, as well as making my speech at the flag off event and asked a lot of students to vote for me thereafter. After the end, at the end, it was a successful one and I won the election. So I urge everyone to push forward and not let limitations to hold you back in whatsoever you feel is right to do, irrespective of what gender, ethnic group, race, or cultural backgrounds you may have. Finally, I want to use this space to thank the university and DUSA for the progress they have been making so far in terms of providing opportunities for black people to feel part of the community. However, more effort is needed to perfect issues around race, equality, and diversity. I think it will be useful and important if we have more diversity of black lecturers and black staff to prove the strength of this global reputable institution where all international students feel and see that sense of cultural diversity being practiced. It's important to note that it creates a healthy culture and environment for a university as big as our own very university. It also improves the university's progress internationally as well as globally. Finally, the issue of race equality and the recent events around the Black Lives Matter can only be eradicated if we can all join hands together and show racism the red card as we are being recognized as global university. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think um, I'm sorry about um, that. Um, Martha's um, audio um, was extremely poor, unfortunately. Uh, I think some, some people seem to be hearing bits and pieces, um, uh, but uh, I think at the end of the day, um, we will just um, need to perhaps um, arrange for Martha to speak at another time. I think it would be a great pity if we didn't um, hear what Martha had to say as part of this event. So we will try um, and set that up, um, as I say, at, at another time. Um, so maybe that um, gives us um, uh, a, a lot of time, Harry, for you to uh, ask and um, be asked questions um, and uh, we can usefully use the, the rest of our time um, to do um, just that. Um, I, I can maybe um, start things off, um, Harry, if I may, by asking you a question around the um, signing up to the Race Equality Charter, which you, you mentioned in your talk. And in one sense, there it feels like such a big agenda and there are so many things that we could be doing. I just wondered if you had a sense of um, what the focus is going to be or the priorities are going to be at the start of our journey um, to achieve the Race Equality Charter, Mark. Uh, thanks, Pam. So you're right. I mean, the, the whole issue uh, in terms of uh, race equality in the context of the charter is it's a, it's a very broad sort of a area of concern in terms of, and, and you're asking where should we actually be focusing? And I think, um, you know, we need to consider um, the sort of staff sort of attitudes um, in terms of how they actually feel within the actual university, how students feel within the actual university. What are we actually doing to cater for their needs? Um, uh, you know, what, why is it that, uh, you know, we've got so many, so few sort of uh, BME staff uh, at um, at senior level 
and what can we do to drive uh, further engagement from from the sort of BME community in terms of um, uh, achieving a greater sort of a um, recruitment in that in that sense. And I suppose one of the things that we we need to consider, uh, maybe that this is a question that, for example, we need to think about uh, it, it, for those who are in leadership roles within the various schools and the, for example, the professional services, be it within the tower building or in the school offices, is that when when folks are making sort of um, when you when you're in meetings and you're making decisions uh, on recruitments on promotion and, or policy making how many of you uh, you sort of uh, senior leaders actually take the time to consider you know do we have any bme bme people around our table um if not how how are we actually sort of learning uh, and incorporating their voices in in our sort of decision making processes um how can how you know, and if we don't have staff, uh, BME staff from those backgrounds uh, on our teams, what can the university be actually be doing uh, in terms of uh, improving that? In terms of, can resources be devoted um, to the training of BME staff uh, for leadership track positions uh, to help create a pipeline of individuals uh, that ultimately challenges the um, the culture that. That some of us actually see is sort of sustaining poor diversification and and representation. So you know, I I think the issue of representation is probably going to be an important one within the actual charter charter work. We need staff and leadership that is representative of the identities uh, of the student community and the larger society. And so I think that's something that we do need to focus on. Thank you for that, Harry and. Just to, to carry on that theme, um, you know, this this is a celebration of um, Black History Month. Um, it's been pointed out into in, in the chat um, that, um, or I think you you mentioned, sorry, in, in your talk, we have um, no Black professors in this university and only two Black lecturers. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a challenge for us to get the representation around the table that you alluded to, um, particularly um, for, for our black members of staff. Um, and I, I just wondered how we would go about um, um, you know, sorting that um, yeah. or, or rising to that challenge because yeah. as our I mean, I, starting from I, such I, a late. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the problem is geography, isn't it? Um, you know, th there are certain institutions uh, where obviously the, the the presence of BME staff is pretty low, and in in those institutions, you know, because of the low numbers of BME staff, there is also then a tendency to not sort of make race equality a priority. You know, that that that's a that's a concern. So, you know, we need to think about well. You know, if we don't have uh, enough BME staff within our community, what is it that we're not doing in terms of maybe uh, attracting those individuals to apply to to, to Dundee uh, and to come to us and and to be considered for positions in Dundee? I mean, if you look at much of the BME staff, it's actually in the sort of low middle ranking sort of positions. Look, they're on soft contract money. There are postdocs. They come here to do postdocs. They go away. They don't stay. And I think we need to start thinking about what other mechanisms and strategies we can start deploying to try and actually make Dundee uh, a place to, for, for them to want to come and to stay. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've got to try and sort of create the opportunities. I'm not suggesting, you know, affirmative action here. And what I'm suggesting is maybe creating a level playing field. That's what's important. And I think people that are already here sometimes feel that there isn't a level playing field. And, you know, I mean, you know, if, if a female is being interviewed uh, for a job, then uh, I am pretty certain that the panel is going to be made up of individuals that contain males and females, you know. But is that the case if you have people from, you know, different racial backgrounds coming? Is the actual interview panel going to have a, a BME member on the panel? Uh, you know, th those those voices need to be heard from and to and and to sort of provide a sense of security for those people who actually come and get interviewed that, you know, I can see a face that I can probably associate with on the other side of the table. And I think there isn't that sense at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I see another question, um, Harry, in relation to 
um, our black community of students and um, the two feeling um, that perhaps um, there isn't a, a, a platform for them um, for those who are studying here and who are black at the University of Dundee and I just wondered if you had any thoughts around our black student community and what more we might be doing for them. Well, I think we really need to encourage these students to engage with the, uh, the BME networks uh, that, that, are, that are currently exist. We do have a staff network. Uh, we have students, PhD students that come along to those networks and perhaps we need to, uh, I mean, I, I would have hoped that that information was out there, uh, but if these students uh, need uh, a platform or a voice that they need to channel their concerns through, then of course, you know, the Equality Diversity Inclusion Office needs to sort of reach out to them and, and let them know of, of when these networks uh, groups are meeting and, and encourage them to attend. Um, that's the only way, only way that they're going to be able to channel uh, their sort of voicing grievances is through that mechanism. I think obviously they, they can approach the EDI office at the university, but they also need to, to feel that they that they can go to a group um, where where they're not going to feel as um, well, feel pressure or a sense of pressure to, to, to where they can actually break their silence. And I think they may find that they can't break their silence in other areas within the. So we need to create safe, safe spaces for these individuals to be able to vocalize and, and let let people know what their concerns are and um, and have staff within those those sort of networks that can sort of uh, um, also guide them in terms of mentorship, in terms of what they need to do. I mean, this comes down to even promotion uh, sort of possibilities for staff. I mean, there, you know, we, we have BME staff who are, you know, who are at lecturer level and who have struggled to sort of progress to the next level and, and they can't understand why. Uh, and it may well be that, you know, there, there are good reasons for that, but perhaps we also need to make sure that we're actually providing them with greater mentorship in terms of saying, listen, this is what you need to do in order to actually achieve uh, progression. And this is, and have individuals who will be willing to actually help them and take time to oversee that their development. Yeah. I, I think also, um, Harriet, it is possible to to learn from um, good good practices and approaches adopted in other institutions. And I know there are other universities um, that are, are further down the road in relation to um, uh, you know, the numbers of, of black staff employed and promoted and, and so on. And I think um, there's always lessons to be learned from other um, organisations and other universities. I just wondered if, if you um, had any contacts in other institutions that we might take advantage of and, and learn from um, on our journey. Well, I th certainly think there are, as I said, there are 15 institutions that have got the actual award. So I think they are probably my first port of call in terms of trying to figure out what they've done right uh, and what and, and and on what basis was the actual charter mark awarded to them. Um, I think we should not fall into the into the trap of trying to sort of just basically uh, copy over what we did for Athena Swan. This, uh, you know, the issues related to race are quite different to to gender. And we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we have a sort of bespoke response uh, to our race equality issues and don't just sort of, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, the processes that were used for Athena Swan can be used as a guide, but we, mm -hmm. you know, I think a number of institutions have made the, the fatal mistake of actually just copying over a lot of their sort of uh, uh, Athena Swan sort of uh, material into the race charter application and they have fallen flat on their face and failed. So we need to be, you know, very mindful that, you know, this is a different set of um, uh, areas that we're looking into in terms of equality. Um, I mean, of course, there's intersectionality that we need to consider as well. And, you know, Athena Swan, I think we've made great strides in, in sort of addressing the gender equality issue at Dundee, um, you know, and I think, you know, part of that might have been linked to the, to the fact that Athena Swan was also linked to funding, you mm -hmm. know, um, and this sort of, serve to incentivize, um, you know, um, addressing the gender equality. So uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, gender equality uh, has seen a sort of rather privileged uh, sort of approach to uh, institutional inequality in, in a sense. And I think, 
if the race charter mark was equally linked in some way to funding, then I'm sure a lot of a lot of institutions would be taking the issue of race equality far more seriously than they're doing at the moment. OK, thanks, Harry. Um, I have uh, another question um, from the chat, which I'll, I'll just read out from Helen, who says I'm interested in Harry's comments regarding the attainment gap. I'm currently involved with research and internationalisation of the curriculum to locate higher education pedagogies and assessments in a more global context. And I would be keen to be in contact with anyone else who has an interest in this area. I don't know, Harry, if you know of anyone um, who is working in that area. I, I personally don't. Uh, I mean, I, I just looked at the, uh, the, re the report from the uh, uh, Universities UK and the National Union of Students uh, report that was published. I mean, you know, I think the the, the average uh, deficit that I uh, in terms of attainment I said was about 13 percent. I think if you look, if you drill down into the actual data within the report, um, the the sort of attainment gap uh, for Scottish domicile students uh, was 11.4 um, percent. Uh, which compares to English students, which admittedly is a lot worse at 13.7% for English domicile students. So there is an issue uh, in Scottish universities. I don't know what this uh, what the situation in Dundee is. I don't have that data. Uh, it would be interesting to know how we um, how we sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, compare with the uh, Scottish average uh, as well as the UK average. OK, um, and just uh, another question, Harry, if I may, from Inca this time, um, who um, is stating role models are also very important. And I wonder if we can help by providing suggestions for the many honorary speakers, etc., that we host. Creating a pipeline for such su suggestions might be helpful. Um, what, what do you think? <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I mean, that's an e excellent, excellent example. Uh, you know, I think we need, you know, even even for individuals at the different levels that operate uh, across the university, whether they're postdocs or uh, early career uh, lecturers, etc. I think, you know, they need to see that other people uh, that have similar experiences or, or, or look like them um, have made it to where they want to go. And you need role models, and I think role models are very important. So I think, uh, you know, um, if, the, if, if there are role models that exist within our institution, or if we need to bring them in to give talks, we should encourage that. I think that's a positive thing. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, thing that perhaps, you know, will facilitate the kind of transformative change that we're talking about uh, in, in terms of culture right across the institution. Thanks, Harry. Um, another question um, touching a bit on actually what, what you covered at the beginning of your talk. Um, the, the question is, um, coincidentally, today marks 10 years since the Equality Act 2010 came into force. If we are still discussing institutional racism, then legal enforcement clearly isn't working. What, in the opinion of the panel, is the most effective way for the university to combat racism? So uh, uh, a big question, <laughs> Harry. <for laughs> no, I, mean, well, I, I mean, you know, um, we we need, I mean, the point is, the, the institution's uh, sort of strategic goals are really something that have got to come right from the top. So, you know, senior management has got to really put its shoulder behind the wheel in terms of, you know, addressing these sort of issues of inequality with respect to race, but also in other areas. I mean, the race, the Equalities Act is not just about race. It's about everything. It's about gender. It's about ableism. It's about, you know, sexism. It's all these kind of things. And, you know, um, these various uh, sort of issues, you know, they can impact they can sort of double up and they and they can affect people who are both black or white. And I think, you know, the university needs to take the whole issue of the Equalities Act in its entirety seriously, and that can only come right from the top. So I would bat the ball right back to you, Pam, and say, you know, um, it's got to come from the centre. It's got to say, listen, you know, it's got to tell the various schools, you know, what is each school doing in terms of sort of uh, advancing the cultural change that's required? 
I mean, I know from a very recent email that Inca sent out to to everybody in, in the School of Life Sciences, asking for ideas and you know how how individuals can think that we can actually promote a change in culture. And I think every school should be doing that. Um, so yeah, you know, you you can get commands from the top, but it's also got to be at each individual level with that schools and, and, and levels beneath that. So everyone's got to play a role. And it's only when everyone, you know, comes together and, and sees that they actually have a stake within the institutional overall goal that we're actually going to achieve a change. Yeah, thanks, Harry. And actually, I, I have a response, a written response from Martha to that question who says, I think emphasising on the law and making it fresh by reintroducing it again within the university to make people, to, sorry, to make black people feel safe um, would be a positive, positive thing. Um, I, I think we've probably just got time for um, one more uh, question, Harry, if I may. Um, and I think it was again around the um, question of representation of um, BME's uh, students and staff on decision making committees across the university. And um, given um, that we um, have such a dearth of um, such staff, um, how can we um, steer clear of concerns around um, tokenism or indeed overburdening the BME's colleagues and students that we have um, in, in sort of taking on such roles. Um, I think that is a challenge, but... Um, it is a challenge. And, um, I respond, Harry, to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a challenge. And I think, uh, you know, you, you can certainly call on your small pool of BME staff if that's, that's your... You know, ultimate sort of default position to go to in a sense. Uh, but you said something right at the beginning and that and that was that as white people, you need to sort of uh, you need to engage with the process yourself. And I think if you know, um, educate yourself, you know, don't don't expect people from ethnic minorities to, uh, you know, educate you on 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 racism. You know? But do listen to their lived experiences. And, you know, if you if you're aware of of, of what, what their struggles are, what their lived experiences are and what their cultural backgrounds are, then perhaps you, you can go into those kind of meetings a little bit better, uh, better sort of uh, prepared. Um, I think the other, the other issue that we need to really consider, and I didn't really want to touch upon it, but I think probably this will be something that will be covered on in, a, in one of the later topics in one of the next sessions, is that many of our sort of students, international students, you know, they're, they're actually having to to come over and they're actually mixing with what is predominantly a white student body, right? And a white student body that sadly, uh, you know, um, has a very poor sort of understanding of their own historical practices in some of the sort of st structures which are symptomatic of what I would, you know, people would say white privilege and, and the sort of ignorance around other cultures, which sort of gives rise to this sort of a, uh, uh, feeling that you know when you have other individuals from other cultures come in they don't feel feel that they're part of the institution and perhaps we can talk about you know decolonizing the curriculum in a sense and that's something that I know that perhaps Fiona might sort of uh, touch upon in her session but I think further education of the student body is also very important if students from different cultural backgrounds different races you know come over that, that, that they feel that they are being accepted a bit more. OK, um, well, I think we're we're just about uh, out of time. Um, I would like to, first of all, just say a huge thank you um, to Harry um, for his um, very thought provoking um, talk this afternoon um, and for um, the great, a great start um, to Black History Month. Um, I'm just so sorry that Martha's connection um, didn't work out. Um, as I said, we will try and rerun her session at another, another time, or at the very least get a transcript um, of, of what she was going to say. 
Um, we've had a, a, a huge engagement and a, a, a lot of questions in the chat this afternoon. Um, we will endeavour to answer all of the questions um, that we haven't got round to in this session. Um, so please uh, do look out for those um, coming in shortly. Um, and uh, that just remains for me to, to thank everyone um, who's attended this session. Uh, thank you for your time, for your ideas and your thoughts and your questions. Um, please do look at the other events um, on the Black History Month programme, which I say, as I said, is running um, through the month of October. And um, I, I look forward, certainly myself, to joining many, many of those. So um, thank you, everyone, and uh, hope to see you all again at some of the other events. <laughs>